nothing is certain but horror and pain. All the walls between the real and the incomprehensible are broken. There is nothing but a dust of souls tossed by fate and crashing against each other. Poles fought Hitler on every front. Of the whole population, one in five perished. When the Poles fight, they say, for your freedom and ours. Owe oddziały polskie wkraczały już do Bolonii. Tłumy wiwatujące na ulicach wyrażały swą wdzięczność każdemu niemal żołnierzowi. Most of these soldiers became exiles. This army never returned to Poland. No other nation suffered so much and gain so little. that the terrible day, the day of war, had arrived. No one could believe it. People were going about their business. You could go out and I had to do a little bit of shopping. You could go and do that. No surprise at my English uniform at all. General morale was extremely high. I don't think, honestly, people had really hoisted in how serious the German invasion was at that time. Warsaw rejoiced. Two days after the Nazi attack, Britain and France declared war on Germany. The papers boasted that the United States was about to join the war, but America stayed neutral. The Germans pressed on. The Luftwaffe ruled the skies and bombed at will. President Roosevelt had asked Hitler to spare civilians. We all lived in cellars, taking beds, mattresses, and whatever we could with us. It was a primitive existence. From time to time, we'd hear this person's dead, that person's wounded. It was all bad news. Poland's leaders had exalted the army as modern and well-equipped. It was neither. The Poles fought hard, but the German tanks tore their plan of defense apart. New orders were issued on September the 10th. The divisions in front of Warsaw was to stand their ground uh, and to defend it to the last man and to the last round, and the rest of the army was to withdraw as far as possible. Well, of course, this was a very momentous decision to have taken, and there was a shocked silence. No air support arrived from Britain. Nothing came of the grand French offensive promised for September the 17th. Poland's army had fallen back towards the Soviet border. On the 17th of September, at 6 o'clock in the morning, we received the first information that the Russian army has crossed the Polish border and moved against the Polish army. A week before the war began, Germany and the Soviet Union had agreed in secret to carve up Poland between them. The split closely followed the line once proposed by British Foreign Secretary Lord Curzon as the Polish Eastern Frontier. After only 21 years of independence, 
the Polish state was again wiped off the map of Europe. In Warsaw, the Germans were the masters. We all cried. The soldiers, the prisoners of war whom the Germans were leading, were also crying. They walked with heads hanging low, many of them in bandages. A very sad moment. Poland had not surrendered. Thousands escaped into Romania and on to France, where a new government and army were being formed by General Władysław Szygorski. Poland resisted courageously the united forces of destruction intent on overwhelming the entire world. It accepted a contest too unequal to have a chance of victory. But the fact that it lost so quickly was the fault of the system, which had been in disharmony with the nation, spending its energies uselessly and harmfully. The new Polish government, settled at Angers in France, was recognized by Britain, France and the United States. The resistance inside Poland acknowledged its authority. Thirty-five thousand Polish soldiers had reached France. Poles from all over Europe joined Sikorsky. When Hitler moved west in May 1940, the Polish army embarked once more to fight the Germans. Though France had failed Poland in 1939, Sikorsky still had faith in the French armies. By the spring of 1940, he was commanding more than 80,000 Polish troops. In June, France surrendered. Stunned, Sikorsky flew to London. Immediately as he arrived here, it was, on, on, I think, on the 18th of June, 1940, when France was already capitulating, he visited the, the Prime Minister Winston Churchill at 10 Downing Street, and um, his question which he put to the British Prime Minister was, are you prepared to fight it up to the end, up to victory? In London, Sikorsky reconstructed his government. Poles under Soviet and German occupation promised him loyalty. His National Council represented all the main political parties active in the Polish underground. Hitler held the continent, but from Britain the Poles fought on. The Polish fighter squadrons shot down one in six of all German aircraft destroyed in the Battle of Britain. Less than a third of Sikorsky's army was rescued from France. Their new home base was Scotland, 25,000 homesick Poles. Churchill broadcast to the Polish nation. This war will be long and hard, but the end is sure. The end will reward all toil, all disappointment, all suffering in those who faithfully serve the cause of European and world freedom. 1941. Churchill needed every Allied soldier he could get. But for Sikorsky, this force was only a remnant. More than half a million Poles were prisoners of war in Germany and Russia. Sikorsky needed to raise a new army. The position was very paradoxical because we had a large number of Polish officers, but not enough, just uh, soldiers. So that no doubt Sikorsky was very keen to, to try to get as many as possible.
Chicago, USA. Sikorsky went to mobilize the six million American Poles. He hoped for at least 45,000 volunteers. 722 joined his forces in Britain. June 22nd, 1941, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. The German tanks drove across Soviet-occupied Poland and deep into Russia. War between Poland's traditional enemies brought hope. We knew that it was thanks to the weakening of our two powerful neighbors that we were able to regain our independence so that no doubt, this attack against Soviets was to us Poles a, a, a very favorable sign. Churchill pressed Sikorsky to sign a pact with the Soviet Union. Polish captives in Russia would be granted what was called an amnesty. A Polish army would be raised in the Soviet Union. The question of the future Polish-Soviet border was shelved. All we had to overcome was a sort of political distrust of Russia, but what the Poles had to overcome was the fact that there'd been a, a fourth partition of Poland in 1939-40 by the Russians, who had stabbed them in the back and had had a large number of Poles, including a very large proportion of the Polish intelligentsia, as the prisoners in Russia. Over a million people had been taken from their homes in Soviet-occupied Poland. Loaded into cattle trucks, they were deported to the empty wastes of Soviet Central Asia, to Siberia and beyond the Arctic Circle. We slept in a communal barrack, um, just on wooden planks, and uh, there was no cruelty. We were just told that uh, we can't escape from there. We'll be eaten by polar bears if we do, or we'll die in the snows. And uh, if we work, and earn some money, we can survive. And there is a Russian saying, who doesn't work, doesn't eat. Polish families had been scattered to camps, collective farms, slave labor mines. When they heard about the amnesty, thousands set out to find the new Polish army. They traveled by foot, rail, by sledge, even by raft. The river started freezing at the sides and uh, sometimes the raft couldn't make it and uh, we just had to cut pieces of the supports away to negotiate ourselves through it. And um, sometimes the, the, the rafts would stand on the um, shallows and then whoever was on them had to go um, into the river to push it. To camps in the foothills of the Ural Mountains came emaciated Polish prisoners captured by the Red Army in 1939. Sikorsky's pact with Stalin had made them soldiers again. We wanted to create a Polish army in Russia, which would fight under Soviet operational command against the Germans, provided that it would be an independent army loyal to the Polish government in London. We were prepared to forget all the wrongs and all the humiliations we had suffered. December 1941. The Germans were attacking Moscow and Leningrad. Sikorsky flew to Russia. Waiting to meet him was the man whose signature on the 1939 Nazi-Soviet pact had condemned Poland to death. Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov. It was the month that Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor brought the United States into the war. At the Kremlin, Premier Stalin receives General Sikorsky. In a new comradeship and understanding, they sign a pact which unites their countries against the German menace. Stalin still laid claim to the Polish territories occupied by the Red Army in 1939, where ethnic Poles had always been a minority. Again, the frontier question was left unsolved. Behind the proud words, there was still bitter mistrust between Russians and Poles. 
both Sikorsky and General Vladislav Anders, commander of the Polish army in Russia, were demanding to know what had happened to 8,000 missing Polish officers. Stalin suggested they might have escaped to Manchuria. He remarked, things sometimes happen. As Sikorsky returned to London, thousands tried to reach the Anders army. I had a small atlas and we were checking the stations and we soon realized that at night when the trains were thundering through miles and miles and miles of step that we are in Asia we are nowhere near we should have been and uh, any questions where on earth are we going was met with answer you are all right as long as you are on the train there are not many places where you can be kept during the war and anyhow, General Anders doesn't need any more of you. Sikorsky and Stalin had agreed that the Anders army would fight alongside the Russians on the Eastern Front. But in February 1942, when the Soviet High Command asked for a single Polish division to go into action, General Anders refused. Encouraged by Churchill, Anders planned to take his army out of the Soviet Union and join the British forces in the Middle East. With the troops would go the ragged mass of exiles who had sought food and shelter in the Polish camps. I thought that the most humiliating feeling is the feeling of hunger. You, there's nothing to sell. You are all in rags and um, you feel so terribly helpless. All Russia was hungry. Without food rations, Polish families were starving. One morning, I just woke up and couldn't wake my mother. And then I realized that she died in her sleep. And there were so many people dying there at that time. The people that were assigned to this job, that were like ghosts of an army, they just couldn't cope with it. Bands of Polish exiles struggled to reach the shelter of the Polish bases in Central Asia and beyond. Across tundra and desert, through frozen forests and up the Siberian rivers, they had sold their few possessions for food and buried their dead along the way. From London, Sikorsky still preached the need for Polish-Soviet understanding. We Poles are considered romantic. Therefore, I want to stress that Poland has embarked on the road of political realism. A genuine understanding with the Soviet Union should ensure for Poland lasting security in the East. In summer 1942, with Stalin's consent, Anders led 115,000 soldiers and civilians out of Russia into Persia. Nearly a million Poles were left behind in the Soviet Union. The evacuation was a calamity for Sikorsky. His hopes of freeing Poland from the east were finished. In Persia, the British provided the arms and equipment Anders could not find in the Soviet Union. When the Anders army, at the moment of the German offensive at Stalingrad, retreated to Iran, the Soviet people began to lose faith in the Poles. They simply began to treat them as those who didn't want to fight the Germans, almost as traitors to the common cause. The Nazis were eager to exploit Soviet-Polish tensions. In April 1943, they dug up 4,000 corpses in a forest at Katyn, near Smolensk. Germany proclaimed to the world that these were Polish officers murdered by the Russians. With help of uniform stukken, axel klapper och belten, fastställer efter världen om vem det rör sig, om mördade officerare. Som medlemmar av den forna polska armén tillhörde de alla tjänstegrader. Redan i åratal hade det saknats av polska befolkningen. There was no proof, obviously. 
to us that it was the Russians who'd done it and the Russians maintained it was the Germans. But I think there were very few of us in the Foreign Office who didn't take it more or less for granted that the Russians had, in fact, done it. While the Germans issued these photographs from Katyn, they were murdering millions in their own death camps. For the Polish government, the Katyn revelations confirmed their fears that more than 8,000 Polish officers alone had been killed by Soviet executioners. When the Poles demanded a Red Cross inquiry, Stalin broke off diplomatic relations with Sikorsky's government. He accused them of collaborating with Hitler. Uh, of course, we, 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 we were pretty horrified, but uh, we were not quite so directly affected, and so we were able still to think in terms of uh, what can we salvage from this in terms of a continuing Polish-Soviet relationship. In Russia, Stalin now fostered Poles friendly to the Soviet Union. Poles from all parts of Poland. Poles from all parts of the Soviet Union. People of different outlooks and political convictions. Today we are united by a great common aim, following the same common road. Deported Poles who had not joined the Anders army were recruited into a new force. Obviously, they didn't get to know the Soviet Union from the best side. And at the beginning, their attitude to the Soviet Union and to the army was one of distrust. Gradually, however, this distrust disappeared once they realized that the army was of a national nature, with all the Polish emblems, hymns, and decorations. The oath had a religious character, just as the whole army did then. The oath, I would say, was of a political and religious nature. We swore to God, but we also swore an oath which spoke of Polish-Soviet friendship and of our common fight against Hitlerism. The new troops marched under the Polish and Allied flags, but this Polish army did not recognize Sikorsky's government. Most of the officers came from the Soviet army. Polish soldiers in Scotland, training for their paratroop wings. A hundred human falcons swoop upon their prey. Sikorsky hoped these men would be dropped into Poland to support risings planned by the underground home army. The attack has been successful. The enemy routed. The dress rehearsal is over. The day will soon come when they will use those wings as the return half of their round-trip ticket from Poland. Outward by the longest route, homeward by the shortest, by air. Poland awaits her sons. June 1943. In the Middle East, Sigorsky watched the Anders army continue its training. The real burden of war was being carried by the Red Army. Sikorsky was planning an effort to restore relations with the Soviet Union. He started back to London. A few hours after this photograph was taken, his plane crashed in the sea off Gibraltar. A British court of inquiry declared that the crash was an accident. Only the pilot survived. The court had no Polish members. Suspicion festered. Sikorsky's death remained a mystery. Through the English countryside, the body of Poland's leader was escorted to a Polish military cemetery at Newark in Nottinghamshire.
by his coffin, the Polish government brooded on the future. Sikorski had been both commander-in-chief and prime minister. Now the leadership divided. General Sosnkowski commanded the forces. Stanisław Mikołajczyk became prime minister. Poland under Nazi occupation was bleeding to death. The government no longer commanded all Poles. In Russia, there was a Polish army sworn to Moscow. Would the Russians or the West liberate Poland? Sikorski's successors were torn by disagreements. Poland would rise from the tomb they knew, but when? And what sort of Poland? The day after General Sikorsky's funeral, there began at Kursk in Russia the huge tank battle which decided the war in Europe. The Soviet armies now went over to the offensive. Two months later, in September 1943, recruits of the new Polish army in Russia moved to the front. General Zygmunt Berling was their Polish commander. Admittedly, we weren't adequately prepared. But September the 1st was the anniversary of the outbreak of war. We emphasized that by September the 1st, we must leave for the front. General Berling and his political commissar planned the first battle. It took place at Lenino. The Poles fought with courage they proved themselves a reliable ally for the Red Army. In Scotland, the new Prime Minister Mikołajczyk inspected his Polish troops. Mikołajczyk, leader of the Peasant Party, Poland's largest political movement, was ready to compromise over the eastern frontier with the Soviet Union if he could be certain that Poland would regain full independence after the war. But his commander-in-chief, General Sosnkowski, was utterly opposed to any concessions. Here I was between two people, the prime minister and the commander-in-chief, who were almost not on speaking terms with each other. Um, if I was too close to Mikołajczyk, Sosnkowski could become instantly suspicious of me. If I was too close to Sosnkowski, then Mikołajczyk wouldn't trust me. Everything you have suffered has been noted in the books of eternal justice and shall become the germ of a new and happier life. We shall go on through land and sea, through mountains and rivers, through forests and steppes, with faith in our hearts and the image of our motherland in our thoughts and our longing. So Skoski was, first of all, totally distrustful of the Allies. He believed that the uh, British government wants simply, is simply trying to find a face-saving formula uh, to retreat from its commitment to, the, to Poland, uh, legal commitments and moral commitments. Um, he was very gloomy in his uh, uh, prophecies about the Soviet policy and behavior. He was sure that Poland will become another Soviet republic. Let the future generations of Poles in a free and happy Poland, remembering the time of fire and flood, say about us that the Polish soldier, at the great turning point of history, has done his duty to the end. He was predicting at least a political conflict and maybe even a military conflict between the West and the East. And in that situation, he felt there may be another chance for Poland. 
Mikołajczyk was excluding the possibility of war. He believed what Churchill told him, there will be no third world war in next 10, 20, 30 years. Mikołajczyk's cabinet could not agree on a frontier compromise with the Soviet Union. Britain and the United States grew impatient. We had, we had to bring pressure to bear a good deal, I think, to say, well, I don't care what is going to happen after the war if you haven't got some kind of agreement with the Russians. Their army is going to, as they would say, liberate, and other people might say occupy Poland, and uh, we can't stop it. I mean, uh, we had no means of stopping it. The British and United States delegations flew eastwards to keep another appointment with destiny, to Tehran, young capital of the new Persia. As the delegations prepared for the Allied conference at Tehran, Stalin insisted that for security reasons, Roosevelt should move into the Soviet embassy. It was there in December 1943 that Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill sat together for the first time to decide their strategy for the final defeat of Germany. Stalin's voice at the conference proved the strongest. He forced Churchill to abandon his scheme for an Anglo-American drive into Eastern Europe from Italy and the Balkans. Eastern Europe was to be liberated and occupied by the Red Army alone. Turning to the question of Poland's post-war frontiers, the Allied leaders decreed that the entire Polish state must be shifted westwards. The Soviet Union would take the pre-war Polish territories east of the Curzon Line. In compensation, Poland would be given German lands to the west and along the Baltic coast. The Polish government was neither consulted nor informed. The Polish government cannot recognize unilateral decisions or fait accompli which have taken place or may take place on the territory of the Polish Republic. Nevertheless, it has frequently given expression to a sincere desire to achieve an understanding with the Soviet Union on a just basis acceptable to both sides. He did see the necessity uh, of trying to reach the best terms possible with Russia, but at the same time, he had to carry along with him many of his colleagues who were by no means uh, ready to do that. Polish government, scene three, take two, Polish. With this in mind, the Polish government is asking the British and American governments to intervene and bring about talks between the Polish and Soviet governments. Washington, June 1944. Mikołajczyk had four meetings with Roosevelt. The president assured Poland of his support. It was election year. He needed the Polish-American vote. Unknown to Mikołajczyk, Roosevelt cabled Stalin, confirming the secret decisions of Tehran. Marshal Rokossovsky, commander of the Soviet armies in Poland, watches his men advance to the crossing of the river Bug on the road to Lublin. As Soviet troops entered territory which all the Allies agreed was Polish, Stalin turned to the problem of who would govern liberated Poland. Already he had revived the small Polish Communist Party. One must realize that this was a party in constant opposition, not only to the government, but to the whole system of government in Poland before the war that it was a cursed party, that it was a persecuted party, that it was a party that had been destroyed by Stalin. Most Poles still supported the government in exile. Mikołajczyk urged the resistance to welcome the advancing Red Army in the name of Poland's legal government. In Moscow, Stalin was putting together his own Polish administration communists and others who would accept Soviet policies. These matters could be best resolved for Poland only by a government of the left, a government capable of reaching an understanding with the Soviet Union. 
As the Red Army freed the Polish towns of Helm and Lublin, pro-Soviet Poles met in Moscow intending to form a government. Stalin preferred a committee of liberation. The Polish Committee of National Liberation was brought into being in Moscow on the 21st of July, 1944. The members of the committee represented none of the main political parties. They agreed to new borders along the Curzon line. Most Polish soldiers advancing with the Red Army lost their homes to the Soviet Union. After a while, of course, they realized that the Polish eastern frontier would be moved west. They accepted this in various ways, some with sorrow. But in the end, they understood this to be an historical necessity. Under Nazi occupation, three million Polish Jews were slaughtered. In all, six million Polish subjects met their death. One in five of the population had perished. Four years of terror were ended by the Red Army. Behind the rejoicing, Soviet security troops were rounding up and disarming home army units loyal to the government in exile. The resistance organized local uprisings against the retreating Germans. The Red Army advanced. In Warsaw, the Home Army commanders argued about their next move. They heard reports from London. I uh, briefed them about Mikołajczyk's views, and uh, my clear conclusion was that uh, the Soviets will be in control of Poland, and that they will be in a position to do here whatever they like. I really made no illusions whatsoever that our cause is lost. And uh, they were listening in with gloom. It was clear that these people are, are in terrible situation. Stalin all the time claimed that so-called home army, underground government, all this institution of uh, underground state are a fiction. So if we don't start fighting, his accusation would be confirmed vis you know, uh, uh, vis a vis the Western world. He, he would say, look, our troops liberated Warsaw. We didn't find any home army, any underground government. From the morning until dawn, they were broadcasting appeals. We are close. You hear our guns. This is the moment to raise in arms to prevent the bridges from being blown and to help the Red Army to cross the river and to occupy the city. We decided to liberate Warsaw uh, by our own force and then welcome Soviet troops as, as our allies, you know, as, as, as hosts in our own house. On August 1st, 1944, 42,000 poorly armed soldiers started the Warsaw Rising. It was to last for 63 days. The Germans were caught off balance. This was the biggest mass revolt the Nazis had faced in Europe. The people of Warsaw celebrated their early victories. The underground state had come out into the open. The population was united. Even Warsaw's communists fought under the orders of the Home Army. The uprising began in an atmosphere of enormous enthusiasm. This was the one piece of free Poland retrieved after so many years of German occupation. The popular belief was that the uprising would be victorious. The first disillusionment came only when we realized that the uprising did not take in the whole of Warsaw. The Warsaw Rising had begun while Mikowajczyk was in Moscow meeting Stalin. When the insurrection broke out, Mikowajczyk begged Stalin to help. 
Stalin pretended during the first three or four days that nothing happened, that the whole insurrection was bogus, there was no insurrection of Warsaw and so on. The rising started just as the Germans halted the Red Army's advance some 12 kilometers east of Warsaw. Stalin complained that the Home Army had acted without Soviet agreement. He refused to help them. Warsaw was bombed by shuttling service of six or seven German bombers who were, had, uh, had the airport near the city and were simply bringing the bombs and, and uh, dropping them, going back, coming back, and it was a systematic carpet bombing with no interference from the Soviets at all. The Western Allies begged Stalin to relieve Warsaw. He refused, calling the rising a mindless brawl mounted by adventurers. When Roosevelt and Churchill proposed supplying Warsaw by air, Stalin denied them the use of Soviet airfields. As ammunition ran out, the insurgents cannibalized unexploded bombs and shells. Improvised munitions factories flourished. The Home Army had planned to liberate Warsaw within days. They ran out of ammunition, out of food and medicine, in what became a two-month siege. Slowly, the Germans fought their way across Warsaw. Auch SS-Verbände werden mit panzerbrechenden Waffen eingesetzt. There were districts where the population was slaughtered street by street. Hitler ordered Warsaw to be erased. We were walked through the streets of burning Warsaw. We could see the flames engulfing our home. Houses were being set on fire, one by one. We were terrified, bewildered. We didn't know what was going to happen to us. The population retreated into the streets still in Polish hands. One month after the rising began, the old city district could no longer hold out. A rescue mission was launched. The general was terribly impatient that the Poles do not make a progress that they were expecting to attack the Germans, and there was very little progress. So I remember he, uh, it was, they were, we were operating in ruins. There was not one house untouched at that, at that time. And uh, he, uh, in my presence, he scolded an officer who said, why don't you move? You, your job is to blow this uh, uh, wall and to attack, he said. Sir, we cannot do it because the courtyard is uh, under the German uh, fire. They know that we are there and uh, we will be decimated there. A few minutes later, I saw a massacre. There were girls with the mines and the grenades was, were dropped one after the others and they, most of the wounds were legs so that most of them were without legs after they were 
you know, transported from the... I don't know how many people were killed in my... In, in front of me. And it was... I felt it was senseless because we were... we had such... Uh, the, the odds were so overwhelmingly against us that to push these young people... they were all youngsters, 18, 17, 16. Uh, many of them were girls. They were extremely brave. They, 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 their job was to go with these mines and to blow this, this, this wall. So they were screams. Uh, the, since they have their bottle with gasoline to throw against the tanks, the gasoline was uh, blew up. So the, you, you had the fire. Uh, it was a macabre scene from the from the Dante, really. And all was unnecessary. Because our people in the old city found the way through the sewers, and they were rescued through the sewers, so that the whole effort was, frankly, a waste of human lives. And uh, I remember this poor officer when, on when he was taken, without with terrible wounds, and he was bleeding profusely, and he just said to this general, "I obey the orders." By this time, there was no longer any belief that we would be victorious. But there was still the desire to resist, to fight to the end. By September the 15th, Soviet forces, including the Polish Berlin army, had reached the riverbank opposite Warsaw. I would like to have thrown myself straight into that river and gone across. This was the normal desire of every soldier, to help his compatriots fighting the Germans. Political officers relayed the Soviet version of events to General Berling's troops. The aims of this uprising, the political aims of the uprising, were anti the people, anti-Soviet, and all in all, directed against us, the soldiers. In the sixth week, Stalin ordered some supplies to be dropped to the insurgents. It prolonged the agony. In the course of the rising, more than 200,000 Poles were killed. had our part of the city where we lived for the 63 days as being completely free and independent. And uh, I will never forget it. The commander of the Home Army surrendered on October the 3rd, 1944. He and his soldiers were treated as prisoners of war. The Germans marched all 800,000 civilian survivors out of Warsaw. This war will be long and hard, but the end is sure. The end will reward all toil, all disappointment, all suffering in those who faithfully serve the cause of European and world freedom. Once again, Britain's Prime Minister poses for a photograph with Joseph Stalin in Moscow. Three days after Warsaw surrendered, Churchill and Stalin met in the Kremlin. They sent for Mikowajczyk. They told him to accept the new Polish frontiers agreed at Tehran. Mikowajczyk said no. The Polish government in exile was doomed. In January 1945, Soviet and Polish troops at last entered Warsaw. They presented Poland with a new leader, Bolesław Bierut. His face was unknown.
speak of history and you're safe. The dead shall not rise up against you. Ascribe to them whatever deeds you want. They'll answer you with silence. Poland was again seen as Christianity's last line of defense, this time against atheism.